Uh, this evening, we have Mr. Tim Bowers with Christiana Care. Tim joined the health system in August 2019 as the Director of Infection Prevention and became Vice President of Clinical Effectiveness in November of 2020. Previous to that, uh, his time with Christiana Care, Mr. Bowers was the Vice President of Performance Improvement at Richmond University Medical Center, Staten Island, New York. He has a BS in Medical Technology from the University of Sciences in Philadelphia and an MS in Health Policy also from the University of Sciences in Philadelphia. Uh, Mr. Bowers, Tim, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. And today is a, a banner day because this is my last meeting and I've not talked on mute the entire day. Um, so this it, the, just the, the weird ways that the pandemic has affected us, that is, that is a goal every day. So I'm glad I was able to, to meet that goal. Um, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I'll start sharing my screen. Um, so yep, yeah, Tim Bowers, uh, lab, lab background. So uh, a lot of the things that I think are cool, many people um, don't get to see every day. So bacteria, viruses, and and diseases are kind of where I grew up for, for college. And it's uh, it makes you a very interesting person, especially at parties and especially during an infectious disease pandemic. So I will uh, let's try and share my screen. I am. There we go. So the, yeah, it's been, uh, if it's been a, a great, but uh, interesting uh, almost two years that I've been at Christiana Care. Um, so we had uh, uh, we had to open up the special isolation unit. We have had a number of Joint Commission, who was our accrediting service um, um, visits to see, just to check under the hood, make sure we're doing everything right. And you know, literally six months into my stay at Christiana Care, we had a full-blown pandemic. So it's uh, it, it has been nonstop. And then in, um, in, again, in November, I was put in charge of, in addition to infection prevention, quality, safety, and patient and some other aspects of uh, patient safety throughout the organization. So um, really excited to be able to um, to talk to this group about kind of you know what has been our life's work over the last year, uh, just a bit. So we're going to go through some um, kind of what the corona, not just SARS uh, SARS CoV two or COVID nineteen is, but the entire family and how that uh, that has kind of generated over the last few years. And then we'll uh, get into some of our current day stuff, and then we'll get into um, kind of what's next and and to predict uh, what's next. I think uh, is going to be pretty tricky, but I'll try to thread that needle. So thanks again for having me. Any questions? By all means, um, again, jump uh, put your questions in the chat. I uh, I look forward to answering them. This, that's really the fun part of uh, of these events. Um, so how do we get from the upper left hand side, which is SARS CoV two, this little thing that's giving us so much trouble? Um, and that's an electron micrograph that turns into, you see the picture of that is a white out pneumonia that it, those are supposed to be clear. You're supposed to be able to clearly see those ribs on a, on a person in the x-ray on the left hand side of that second picture on the right hand side is a, is a uh, that was post lung transplant. That was what COVID did to somebody's lung. Um, the third picture is a proning method, which is when you're get, delivering somebody oxygen, you put them on their chest in order to better to, to better have the oxygen absorbed to allow them to ventilate better. And that little contraption over top of their head, um, the I think it was Italy uh, pioneered using that as a way to um, to have a non-invasive way to to get ventilation into your lungs. And on the right hand side is just a full full hospital. Uh, I think that is that is a field hospital that was built and is completely full of ICU patients. And this is kind of what it looks like today. These pictures are from, uh, this particular picture is from NPR. I think NPR has got a good COVID tracker. I like, um, I like green, yellow, and uh, orange or green, yellow, orange, and red for me because I'm pretty simple and I like to know what, what, what the areas I need to focus are on when I start to look at, at something. So you can see um, as of right now, the, the Northeast I think is, is a bit of a hot spot and less so in, um, in Hawaii and Guam. If anybody were looking for a place to relocate during, uh, during the infectious disease pandemic, they seem to be doing pretty, pretty well. Not just the United States thing, this is a global pandemic. So you get to see this is, um, this is NPR and it is a little bit um, larger. It's one of, um, again, one of my favorite ones because you get to see relative to other performance, how are things going with the, um, how are things going with the pandemic? 
Uh, so again, we're going to talk about the coronaviridae, which is the family of uh, coronaviruses. Um, so that we're going to um, kind of understand which coronaviruses are important, which ones are not. Um, this is SARS-CoV-2, so uh, clearly there should have been a SARS-CoV-1, and we'll talk about that too. We'll talk about the pandemic today, including some treatments and vaccines, so a little bit of, of, of vaccine information, a little bit of treatment information. I am not a physician, so I don't, I don't typically lean on um, or, or really lean into the treatment um, aspect of, of COVID-19, though I did ask Dr. Marcy Dries, who's our Chief Infection Prevention Officer and Infectious Disease Physician, to kind of give me some pointers on what to talk about. My wheelhouse, which is transmission uh, and prevention, those two go hand in hand, knowing the two, and then of course going forward. Um, bit of a nerd slide. For those that love Latin, if you've taken it, good for you. I actually still remember a lot. Yeah, I still remember. Um, I still remember my Latin classes from high school, so it actually pays dividends if you're going to go into, if you're in the medical field. So the uh, coronaviridae of the entire family, they're enveloped positive strand RNA viruses. So they're not DNA. It's, it's like a, a RNA is different than DNA, and it's only a uh, the positive strand of it, and it's enveloped. It's encased in something. Um, and so I think there are some pictures later of kind of what that looks like. Uh, but it just kind of, that's why it goes into the coronavirus. Those are the type of viruses that are in that particular uh, family. They infect uh, birds, mammals, and amphibians. And there, there's actually two, uh, two families in the coronaviridae. There's uh, Letoviridae, and that really is just uh, for frogs. So frogs have their own uh, have their own family of coronaviruses that affects them. Uh, that is not jumped over to um, to humans at this point, and we're I think I'm pretty excited when I, whenever I can say that. Then there's the Ortho coronaviridae, and there's a bunch of groups in there. So mainly before 2003, the coronaviruses were just really the common cold, mild respiratory illness, a little bit of GI distress. Um, so th there are a number of them, and they're classified as alpha, gamma, delta, and beta. Uh, alpha, gamma, and delta, they infect a variety of animals. And throughout the world, definitely outside the United States, the relationship between humans and, and uh, non-human species are, are really a lot different. Um, so in, in Delaware, you know, I live in South Jersey, you know, depending on where you're driving, you can see some animals pretty quickly. And maybe, maybe a person or two has, uh, I know my neighbor has chickens and at least one rooster uh, that, that's in my backyard, but that's not like that around the world. So viruses that can infect animals um, can definitely cross over if there's a lot of uh, interconnection between the two. And that's the alpha, gamma, and delta. Pigs, bats, rats, humans, Geese, birds, and the beluga whale has uh, can also contract a, uh, a coronavirus. I would love to know how that happens. The beta coronaviruses, though, that's that's those are the ones where we have viruses of concern. So uh, the the Mervic cro cro Merv so I'm trying. <laughs> MERS-CoV is the second word, and MERS-CoV stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And so that was in uh, 2012, and that was in uh, Saudi Arabia. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So that was actually the second coronavirus that caused, um, that was significant for humans. And then there's uh, the other coronaviruses, which is SARS-CoV, which is uh, SARS, the original 2003 China, and then SARS-CoV-2, which we are, um, which we're experiencing right now and continue to experience. I linked two links at the bottom. There's a ton of links in this because I have um, a lot of sources that I uh, that I quote from because I didn't do the original research and I want to give credit to those that did. I typically caution against citing Wikipedia, uh, but for things like when you're going into the families and genus and species of different um, different organisms and viruses, we uh, it's it's kind of, uh, it's, it's an okay source as long as you validate it with something else. So um, apologies for Wikipedia sourcing, but in this particular case, it worked out well. Uh, so all the coronaviruses, uh, they uh, cause respiratory infections in human. They range again from largely, you know, mild, a cold, uh, and, you know, in the case of of COVID, an asymptomatic infection, to severe infections, and, and of course, fatalities. Um, and so in chickens, they cause an upper respiratory disease. I've never heard a chicken sneeze, but I'd be interested to see that. Uh, and cows and pigs, it's mostly GI distress and diarrhea. Um, and it's important to note that for the entire class, other than COVID-19, there are no vaccines. 
and there are and no antivirals exist specific for those viruses. Uh, and that's kind of the the spot that we found ourselves in about a year ago. So SARS-CoV, this is the original one. You see the picture on the right-hand side. I just want to mention that despite uh, 2003 being a number of years before Facebook, um, there was still uh, there was still a lot of I'll call fear mongering. Um, so I think that the uh, it was more the magazines and and publications like that that were um, that were really whipping up a stir around around SARS. You would have thought it was crawling across um, the White House lawn the way that that it was covered. It was important. It was incredibly important. But uh, the level of, of fear that they garnered was, was very significant. So originally in two, 2002 in southern China, and then it turned into a global threat in 2003. Uh, two to seven, so the, the illness, the course, if you get SARS, two to seven days after illness, dry cough. Does that sound a little familiar? Um, with progression to hypoxia, which is low, uh, low blood oxygen, you may or may not have uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and transition almost, almost always, um, I'll say almost always without numbers in front of me, but it, it was very likely that you transitioned from that dry cough to pneumonia uh, within a week or two. And, and that was the problem was people that got sick got incredibly sick and it was tough to bring them back. Uh, it was contagious at the onset of symptoms, but most contagious in the second week of illness. So if you think about somebody who's likely to transition to pneumonia, by the time they're in their second week, they're in the ICU. They're not typically at home. They're not typically in group settings. Um, so a lot of this has had to do with, um, with individuals who were in the hospital systems that were getting sick while, that were getting people sick while they were in the hospital, not necessarily at home. And there was no cases that were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So pre-symptomatic um, is a word. And if, I've, uh, if I'm saying words that have not been defined for you elsewhere, by all means ask. Um, I'm, I'm the king of asking people what that means. I say it over and over and over again. I might as well have it tattooed on my on my badge at work. Um, so pre-symptomatic means, you know, in the days before you become symptomatic. So I might be asymptomatic today. I'm hopeful. I, I know that I am hopeful that I didn't get exposed to COVID-19. I'm pretty safe. But if I was exposed and I end up getting symptomatic tomorrow, I wake up tomorrow with one of the symptoms that's classic of COVID, I would have been pre-symptomatic today and pre-symptomatic the day before that. It, with SARS, with the original SARS, COVID-2002, none of that happened. Uh, infection prevention measures. So standard precautions is kind of protect what you're going to go in there. Um, protect, protect yourself against what you think you're going to meet when you go in there. I always tell, um, you know, new nurses, and, and they, they kind of chuckle, um, you know, if you have a patient that's incontinent and you're going to go in to turn them, you should probably wear a gown. If you have a patient that's coughing, you know, excessively, this is pre-COVID. If, if you have a patient that's constantly coughing, wear a mask. You, you need to protect yourself when you go in there, just in case. So that's standard precautions. Contact precautions are for things that that transfer by touch, things like MRSA or what's called C diff or hospital-associated diarrhea. Those things all transfer by touch. Um, and you know, one that everybody remembers is norovirus. Um, and from the few people that I see on my screen, does anybody know what norovirus is? Just so I can make sure. It's okay. It's, it's the, um, the stomach flu. It is the one where you sit bolt upright two o'clock in the morning and you have to use the restroom right now. Uh, and there is no stop. There is no collect $200. You are going uh, to where you need to go. So that's, that's the normal virus. That's the stomach flu. That's, that's by touch. So doorknobs and things like that. Um, so the, the measures for inside the hospital, we would wear a gown, we would wear gloves and things like that if we have something that's contact. And then there's airborne isolation. I actually have a next uh, a slide after this about that. And that's when things really hang up in the air uh, for a long time. It was a global outbreak. 8,000 people were infected, 774 deaths, uh, but only eight uh, confirmed cases were in the United States and all were travel associated, none were fatalities. So uh, despite Newsweek, you know, putting that on the, the front page, you know, eight cases, 50 states, uh, none were, were transmitted here, you know, thankfully looking back, but it's not, um, it, it's not something that really may have garnered that much attention. Hey Tim, we've got a question in the chat. Would you say those who were younger were more asymptomatic than those who were older when they contracted COVID? Good question. Um, so this is SARS. This is 2002. We, we do have a slide on COVID. I don't think age really, um, I don't think that they've ever said that age plays a factor in whether or not you are asymptomatic. 
um, it, the um, the likelihood that you will develop significant symptoms and significant problems increases with the number of comorbidities you have, which kind of increases with age. So typically heart failure, your heart's not working all that right. You have heart high blood pressure, diabetes, a lot of these things happen later in life. Uh, but I think once you control for that, asymptomatic doesn't necessarily um, care what age you are. COVID doesn't really care what age you are. Good question. I saw projectile vomiting. Any other uh, any other questions from the from the chat? <laughs> Uh, nope, not at the moment. Awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit, uh, this is a sidebar, isolation PPE. I think we've heard about PPE in the news a lot, and that's um, personal protective equipment. So for for SARS, it was a, you, know, you see the big gown, you see the glove, um, and then you see that mask that's on and it says an N95 or higher. We've been educated about N95s, especially early on in the pandemic. And that number means that 95% of all particulates are filtered before it gets to the user. Um, and, but in order to actually have that number be correct, you actually have to be fit tested. So there's a, there's a test that we do. We spray saccharin in the air or bitters in the air. We put that thing on, we seal it around your mouth and in your jaw. And, you know, if you have uh, facial hair like me, guess what? It's not an, N, in, it's not an N95. It's just an expensive mask because you're, <laughs> sorry, um, it, you, the hair is preventing that seal from happening. So that seal has got to happen all the way around. And uh, it's really, really important to do that. And so um, that's the type of mask when you're in airborne isolation that, that's needed. But it's not just the mask itself. So there's also the airflow. So if you have somebody who has an airborne disease, the classic example is measles. Um, everybody knows that measles is, well, many people know that measles is one of the most contagious diseases on the face of the planet. And it's because it travels really far in the air. And so if you are in airborne isolation, you have to suck the air out of the room that the person is in, filter it, and then typically we expel it on the top of, we expel the clean air on top of the, um, on top of the hospital, where, or away from where everybody is. And so those two things make up uh, airborne isolation generally. And that's what was required for SARS. It's also what's required for MERS. MERS is thought to have come from camels, though we can't really find a source. It was identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. Um, and again, five to six days after exposure is when you would get sick, fever, cough, sh cough and shortness of breath. Um, the infection prevention measures were again, standard um, contact with the gowns and gloves and then airborne isolation. That, that outbreak actually lasted uh, eight years. It was really a slow burn. Um, not a lot of cases, 2,521. And I think that gets back to the, we don't know what the source was for, for MERS-CoV. We have a few ideas. We can never find that source. Um, uh, 2,500 cases, 866 deaths. So one in four chance you were going to die if you had, if you had MERS. Um, 27 countries almost entirely linked to the Arabian Peninsula where Saudi Arabia is, uh, except for South Korea. So South Korea had uh, 186 cases. And really, I, I have a bullet down there. It was one traveler that went to four different hospitals and was contagious while at those hospitals and was in, uh, was in the setting with, without a mask, uh, in close quarters with individuals. So staff and visitors and other patients became sick. And then since it's five to six days after exposure, they're discharged from the hospital, they go to a different hospital. Um, so it ended up being you know, a, a sizable outbreak. And that was, uh, that was a big learning experience for all of us in hospitals to make sure that we're identifying things early. And it really reinforced a lot of the lessons that we learned in SARS about identifying the uh, identifying patients who potentially could be contagious um, and, and making sure that they're segregated. Oh, COVID, now we're here. So number three on our list is COVID. Uh, it was identified in the Wuhan province, China. I actually still have the email that we talked about it on January 8th, which is the day after the World Health Organization said, there's this little thing that's happening. 28 patients in Wuhan province, China have developed pneumonia. Um, and that's when, so uh, we're at 16 months, 16 months now for our outbreak response, because we actually started that day not knowing what was going to happen. Again, likely a bat origin, but still we don't know for sure. Um, symptoms, these are a little bit different, right? So a uh, cough, loss of sense of taste and smell, it's called anosmia or agusia, and uh, also shortness of breath and, and occasionally some GI, but some, definitely some headaches, a lot milder than the last two. Um, 
Infection prevention measures for this one is actually different. It doesn't actually, it's not actually airborne all the time. It, we can make it airborne by things that we do, but it's standard contact and droplet. So not an N95 mask, just a regular surgical mask is fine. Um, airborne can be can be an issue in certain things. So um, for certain activities, we'll talk to that uh, towards the end, but it's really, you know, when you're being loud and you're inside with, with stale air not moving very well. And as of right now, 142 million cases, 3 million deaths um, in the U.S. It's 31.6 with oh, over half a million Americans dead from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, didn't know we'd be here when we started. Uh, I got to tell you that, but that's uh, that's where we're at today. There's a number of trackers out there to help um, show where who, who, how COVID is behaving locally, and I think it's important to to use those. So the Tim. CDC put up. Yeah. Do you know, there's a question in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. There are two questions in the chat, so this might be a good spot to, to pause. The first question is, the people who contact contracted SARS or MERS, did they develop any antibodies that would have protected them from COVID-19? Good question. Um, I don't know that that's been... Uh, I don't know that that's been published, whether or not it's been studied. Um, but I think that's actually something I will take back from this. I'm going to say <laughs> probably not, um, only because they are different enough to be different species, um, but that's a good question. And then the second question is, what is the difference between a standard and a contact infection? Oh, thank you. Did, did uh, MERS or SARS confer immunity? Sorry. Oh, I, like, I like that you're taking notes. Um, so standard and contact. So standard <laughs> is... Standard is you don't know what they have um, in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of disease prevention. So your regular patient that comes into the ER with um, a sports injury, right? So they're playing basketball, they twisted their knee or they rolled their ankle. It's bad enough where they have to go to the ER. ER in normal times is not going to wear an N95 in that room, right? So they're, they're coming in for something that's normal. If they have to um, if it's, if they rolled it so bad that they have to do like open it up, you know, they'll use gloves, they'll use, they'll protect themselves against the person's blood. Um, if they, uh, if they have to go inside their mouth for anything, not for the, we're clearly off of the rolled ankle, but if they, if it was like a, um, a sore in your mouth that, that they were looking at, they would wear gloves when touching your mucous membranes. If you're coughing, not knowing whether or not you're flu, um, they should wear a mask and probably some eye protection. That's standard precautions. But if I know you have MRSA, um, or another bacteria that's really resistant to antibiotics, I'm going to wear a gown because I'm not going to take that out of the room with me because I don't want anybody else to get that. Same thing with C. diff. If you have C. difficile, which is antibiotic-associated diarrhea, only bleach kills that. I really don't want that hanging around on my clothes. So I'm going to make sure I wear a gown and gloves and wash my hands and things like that. So standard precautions used to be called universal precautions. And it's just, you know, making sure that if there's blood, you always wear gloves, things like that. If you're going to touch somebody's mouth, always wear gloves. Um, but the the contact is, I know that there's something in there and it's, it's probably going to be able to spread if I can't keep it in this room. And so I'm going to wear a gown and, and gloves. And it's for certain um, it's for it's for a certain bacteria. If you're inside of a hospital, we actually have a lot of signage. We have a lot of signage in hospitals, but we have specific signs on patients' doors that say contact isolation, drop it isolation, and there's typically some instructions on there. So um, important if you're visiting a loved one, make sure you're looking at the door for those important keys. We put it on the door because even nurses and physicians sometimes, you know, they are they're focused on keeping patients well. We have to co we have to focus on keeping those. Um, we have to focus on keeping those caregivers well too. So a uh, good question about the difference between standard and contact. Hopefully I, uh, I explained it well enough. So this is how coronaviruses work. And we talked a little bit about the, the structure of it. So you see the outside, the, it's called a corona be, uh, because of the, the crown that it, that it wears. The, um, it, and it's uh, enveloped and you see the, the positive strand RNA out here, it hits your, recep your receptor. Uh, I, can, I can talk about this for days, but I'm gonna be quick about it. Um, and so this is, um, and then it, it comes into the cell. So that it's inside the cell, it actually tells your ribosomes, I'm pointing to the screen as if you can see me, left-hand side, um, the, the ribosome actually does the job and makes a viral polymerase, pro pro polymerase late at night. So, uh, so that way the virus itself starts making its own uh, its own parts. 
And so it makes that positive strand RNA. It makes the little pieces that will eventually be the, the corona, the outside, and it goes to work. And so you can see that it goes in two different, um, two different paths. So it makes the RNA that will eventually curl around and be inside the, the viral particle. And then it makes all of these little pieces that are blue and green and purple and pink that, uh, that encompass it and make it another whole virus. And so when that virus gets in, that cell is now a virus making factory. And what it's gonna do is it's eventually going to explode because it's not doing its job anymore. And what it explodes is all of the, the existing viruses that are in there. So some are released and some are just released because the, the cell eventually dies. Coronaviruses are really good at this. And especially the three that are of concern for us. Um, so if, you, if you're a nerd like me and you really like the interior structure of cells, this is the coolest slide of the, the presentation. Something tells me I'm alone in that, but that's okay. So what's really different between MERS and SARS and SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19? So what is this is uh, the, our ability to detect uh, viral particles in certain specimens. And you can see top left is the uh, SARS-CoV, the original one. Day zero is the day of, of uh, symptom onset. And so really, barely a, barely any virus. And then all of a sudden, week between uh, the end of week one, beginning of week two, huge swell. Same thing for MERS-CoV. Um, again, really early on, very low, and then a huge swell. Both of those very fatal viruses, right? So um, even with those, those small ramp ups until that huge swell for, for the viral load, um, still was, were able to kill between one in three and one in 10 patients that, got, that, that were infected. So if, even if it did, you know, swell earlier, that that patient's actually not going to be around long enough, really, to um, to infect a lot of other people. Uh, top right, SARS-CoV-2, a ton of virus is available the day that you are symptomatic. So the day you lose that sense of taste, you've been for the last two days, you've had some viral particles that have been excreting for you, and this is the reason why you can't just test your way into low numbers for COVID because. The day you realize you've got a positive test, you've been excreting virus for two days. It's also not as fatal. So really you're walking around probably feeling crummy, but not necessarily, I need to get to a hospital right now. And what, and that's a huge difference. Those two coming together is, is for me, the biggest difference between SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. And really you can see it mimics, uh, that's H1N1 down the bottom. It, it really mimics how flu works. And if that's like a normal flu, um, in that, you know, a day or two before symptoms, you're, you're excreting flu, you know, you have a little bit of flu uh, virus that's being um, shed from you. And so a coronavirus that acts like a flu is, is a recipe for exactly what we have right now. January 4th, there were four countries. Uh, the February 15th, there were 28. And I think part of this is just the way that we travel as humans. We, we crisscross the globe all day, every day. We're good at it. And unfortunately, within 60 days, 165 countries, and I'm sure those three, four, or five that are down there um, have, had, um, have had coronavirus now. So 28, let me make sure that I'm on time. Um, and so, you know, I'll say what happens next is history. Um, this is one of the busiest crossroads in all of Philadelphia. This is by the RP, uh, that's Benjamin Franklin, um, oh, the Franklin Institute, sorry. Um, and you can see that 676 that, that um, is heading towards us uh, in the distance, completely empty. That doesn't happen. That has never happened in my entire life until this. And it was eerie seeing these photos, but um, I think it was the right thing to do. Drew Fennell from Christiana Care calls uh, our shutdown, so it's humans shut down, not just Americans, everybody shut down. She called it the greatest act of humanity in our history. And, and I gotta say, that's probably the best way I've ever heard it, heard it explained. Th scenes we never thought we'd see. Um, we have the, um, the, the, the ship in the harbor for New York was one of those, was one of those minute moments where even despite all the things we were seeing, I, I, I gasped. I was like, I've never, I would have never thought any of this was possible. But also we got to see some of our caregivers really, all of our caregivers really, but some of them really took a, a front line role and helped out. That's Heather Farley on the left-hand side, Center for Work Life, Work Life Wellbeing, just uh, sprung into action the minute they realized how bad this was getting. They were there for our caregivers. And up and right, you know, our nurses are pretty awesome. And uh, they had 
they had a tough job, but they really helped each other out and they had some good morale up there too. FYI, the two white masks are N95 masks and the orange mask is a regular cloth mask in case you wanted to see what some of those look like. Um, and Dr. Fauci, we trust, uh, that's entirely true, uh, but Dr. Dries is our chief infection preventionist and she's the one we follow. So typically they agree, almost entirely they agree, but uh, push comes to shelf. Um, that's that's definitely, we're gonna follow Dr. Dries and that's my favorite picture of her, really a boss looking picture right there, right? She's clearly the one in charge. Um, so a year and four months after that first email where we were talking about that this is what the United States looks like as it relates to COVID-19. Darker is higher rates of trans, uh, of, um, of COVID and lighter is, is lower rates of COVID. Um, tough map to look at knowing all that we know um, it's available. This is Johns Hopkins. If you've not seen the Johns Hopkins site, they have a, a lot of resources. This is one of my favorite because it gets down to the county level for, for COVID-19. I see somebody writing it down. So just give me a thumbs up when, you're, when you've got it. And I, one of the other things I like to see is in the Northeast, you can see how small our counties are as opposed to like Wyoming. It's got like two counties. So Tim, why don't I ask you some questions while people are writing down these links. And just a reminder to everybody, the PowerPoint will be available online um, once we once we render the video and everything. So, you know, you don't have to take notes that quickly. Um, can you get COVID more than one time? So we have seen, uh, and there, there were cases as early as I think June, uh, maybe June or July of reinfection. And so the, you know, early on, back up. So the testing for COVID, especially early on, was really uh, to the genetic level. So we're looking at the, D we're looking for the DNA or the RNA of the virus, which means we can detect it long after it's dead. If you have just pieces of chopped up COVID that are floating through you because your body did a good job of, of getting rid of it, we can, that, that is potentially detectable for weeks to months. And so trying to discern, you know, somebody who has developed spring allergies after having COVID in Thanksgiving, that's real tough. Um, so we, we do look at uh, a few things. So they look at how long it takes. Uh, it's called cycle time or cycle threshold for the test. And so in those particular cases, it's case by case, but it has, it has happened where people have gotten COVID more than once. And now with the uh, occurrence of all of, of the number of variants of, of COVID, which is COVID, but kind of a little bit different than COVID. And we have a, a slide about that later. It is, uh, it is possible to get COVID more than once. And that's, uh, that's a scary proposition. All right, I have a scarier one for you. Oh, yeah. Are we prepared to tackle a possible SARS-CoV-3 strain? Uh, I guess it depends. Um, I think that, I think I'd like to answer that at the end. Okay. <laughs> um, Remind me of that though. That's All a really right. good one. <laughs> we do have a question of the difference between variants and mutations, but I think you're going to cover that coming up. Yep. Um, are earlier COVIDs likely to stuff your nose until you can't breathe through your nose from time to time? Earlier COVIDs. Uh, so early, er, like earlier SARS, like SARS and MERS? Or I, are we talking? I don't know. They just said earlier COVIDs. So uh, earlier SARS, uh, which is SARS and MERS, much more likely to be pneumonia. So that's not really stuffing your nose. That's, um, if you've ever had pneumonia, and I realize that I'm the only 36 year old to ever get pneumonia in the summer, um, it's pretty it's pretty scary. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an endurance athlete. I do, I do triathlon and I was training for a long one. I guess I was just overtrained and run down and I could not for a week take a deep breath. And I guess I hadn't realized it, it was building over time. But when I realized it, it was the most frightening thing I had ever been um, I'd ever been involved in. So the, uh, th they were a lot worse than a stuffy nose. Um, whereas with COVID, we're seeing the, the gamut of stuffy nose to, to ICU level care. So I'm going to hold off on the, the other questions because they're about vaccinations. So I feel like you might get to that later. Um, yes, so later. that's it for now. Perfect. Thank you so much. I can't appreciate your, I can't, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate uh, the help with the with the chat because I, I will get distracted and we'll be here for two, three days. Um, so again, left-hand side on this screen, you will see it's again the Johns Hopkins, but I zoomed in on Delaware. Uh, we got some, we have some struggles. 
in, in Delaware, um, not nearly as struggling as New Jersey um, or the most of the islands of New York. Um, so it's uh, Northeast, generally we are packed in like sardines compared to the rest of the country. Um, I am from New Jersey, well, I live in New Jersey and we are the most densely populated state in the United States. Not surprising that a respiratory virus spread really, really well there. Um, but it is pretty interesting the way that the, the outbreak has unfolded, kind of starting north um, in, in Mid Wilmington, Middletown, Smyrna, and then towards the, towards the summer, really going more towards the, the beaches where individuals were starting to, to congregate there, maybe not necessarily as distant as they should be. So um, these are, the one on the right is actually, the, the map on the right is actually available through DHHS, DHSS. Um, and Delaware's got a lot of resources on, um, on how we're doing. So this is Delaware's COVID experience in the long haul, right? So April 1 to April 20, you can see we've had um, at least three different, uh, three different waves and we're on our fourth. So there was the original one and the, uh, the you get, looking at the average, looking at the, the, blue, the blue bars is probably the best way. Um, so the, the early one in the spring, we had another one towards the end of the summer. It was more of a swell than a surge, but depending on where you were in the country, it was a, it was a much larger surge. And then the holidays really, the COVID really went for broke um, and, and really succeeded. So the weeks after Thanksgiving, you know, you could really see that there was a lot of transmission going on. Um, I'm sure nobody meant to get sick or get anybody else sick. But that was that was the result of of our of human behavior towards that that time of the year, um, really stressing all of our hospitals, our outpatient clinics, our ability to to, to you know serve those individuals. Um, Delaware, I think we did a much better job than than a lot of other states. Some other states, I think um, Arizona particularly, I think was was called out for you know, they were out of uh, there was a few states that were out of ICU beds. And they actually had to ship people across state lines in order to get ICU level care. Um, so we we were able to manage our resources a little bit better than that, a, good, a lot better than that. And so that really started coming down uh, mid January towards February. And ever since the last probably four or five weeks, we've started to see that increase again in the spring, uh, the fourth wave. The the fourth wave is is probably because of a number of things. Um, we made a big deal about vaccines. We have a lot of vaccine and you know, the vaccines that we use are effective and safe, but they're not, it's, it was not necessarily rolled out as quickly as we had hoped um, between supply and, and some of the logistical issues and making sure that we're doing things equitably, you know, important to, uh, to do all that, but it slowed it a little bit. Also, you know, the weather's getting nicer. People are kind of tired of being inside. Um, and so there's the, the feeling that the vaccines will save the day. And I got to tell you, just like testing, you cannot vaccinate yourself completely out of this. Part of this is still human behavior that we need to, uh, to keep an eye on. So all of this is kind of, um, in addition to the, the spring holidays, all of this is kind of um, keeping us from seeing low numbers as low as we can. And again, this is Delaware, April 7th to April 20th. You see it's a, it's a, a bit of a steep increase um, week. This is uh, day over day. And again, this is all available on the, uh, on the DHSS um, websites. I think they do, again, a good job of keeping up with the data. Uh, and that was the last one for this. So it's been, uh, it's been an up and down year without, without a doubt. And um, without, you know, sustained improvement in vaccination rates, in mask wearing and distancing, you know, it's going to be tough to, to really keep numbers low, um, to say the least. And I got to say right now, the one thing that I didn't put in here, uh, because it kind of came up today, um, the United States is the most vaccinated country uh, when it comes to COVID, right? So I think it was announced last week, at least half of all United States adults have received at least one dose of the vaccine. That's phenomenal. That's amazing. That's also one of 200 countries in the world and one of our much larger countries, um, India, who's three times our size, is seeing um, positivity rates in the 33%. So three, one out of every three people that get tested in India right now is positive. They're in, they are a very large country to have that high of a number. So they're not, um, they're not where, we're, where we're at with vaccination either. 300,000 positive COVID tests uh, yesterday. And so it's, it, it's a stark reminder that, you know, 
uh, we, we are not alone. Um, and we are definitely not out of this, although we are making some headway, at least in our country. Treatments and vaccines. So uh, treatments at a glance. I, I, I could not talk about treatments without talking about hydrochloroquine because everybody was talking about hydrochloroquine this time last year. It was the miracle drug. Um, the <laughs> orders for hydrochloroquine went up like 1,500%. Um, overnight when, when it was mentioned um, in, in the media. So uh, unfortunately, uh, it was found to have just about no impact um, and no, no efficacy. And really, actually, in some studies showed an increase in mortality. So it's in, in at least one study, more people died that were taking hydrochloroquine for COVID-19 than, than the control arm. And that's a recipe for an ended study uh, because you can't continue doing that to people. It's not ethical. Um, so it was suggested as a treatment almost a year ago. Um, and then by the June 15th, the uh, emergency youth use authorization uh, was withdrawn. So what's emergency use authorization? The FDA will approve drugs for certain reasons with specific data that says that it's safe, then that it's effective and that um, and all of this. An emergency use authorization is um, less than that. And so it's a uh, the the easy example is AZT for, um, for HIV in the, the late 1980s. Late 1980s, um, HIV was not a chronic disease. It was killing a lot of people. AZT's trial was found early on to have significant benefit in terms of reducing mortality. So instead of making the drug maker uh, continue their study for another two or three years to prove, they said, um, it, it looks like you're not having any worse outcomes. You're actually having better outcomes. This, this is safe and effective as we see it today. Continue to study it, but we can give it to these patients because they sorely need it. And so the emergency use authorization, which is what the vaccines have and what any of these treatments would have for COVID because we just don't have the studies to back up a, a full approval. Hydrochloroquine, that was, re that was recalled pretty quickly. Uh, so by June, hydrochloroquine, the FDA said, um, you can't really write a prescription for hydrochloroquine specifically to prevent COVID. And that's probably the biggest indicator that you shouldn't take it. Um, in addition to a number of, of experts saying that it, it's not, not, not appropriate or not, not really shown to be effective. Um, and again, all of this down, uh, down the bottom, you see COVID-19 treatment guidelines .nih.gov. Uh, if you Google COVID-19 treatments, NIH, uh, that, that's your first link that pops up. Um, azithromycin, z -pack, which we typically take for, um, for our common colds, that was shown to provide no benefit for severe COVID. Zinc, man, if I had a, if I had a nickel for every time I opened up Facebook and heard about zinc, um, but it, there was no studies that show that, it, that it's uh, efficacious against COVID-19. And so it's, just, you know, you should get zinc through your diet and all that other, just don't take more than, your, than the dietary recommendation of zinc um, as of right now. Remdesivir, and this is where the names get hard. So remdesivir is, uh, is approved for hospitalized patients. And so these are all uh, being studied now, but this, uh, this is one of the drugs that has shown promise to decrease days on ventilation and, and improve outcomes in the hospital. Thamlinivimab, um, and that's of those four, of those two, two drugs, I, that's the only one I can say. Thamlinivimab was a monoclonal antibody. So it's an antibody that is, um, that is cloned over and over and over again and was given to patient. That and um, one of two other drugs, when those two are combined in the outpatient setting, it can actually prevent people from needing to be hospitalized. And so that was really, uh, logistically that's tough because you really only have a day or two to get this drug in, uh, into the patients in order to keep them out of the hospital. But when you do, it's got a, it's got a tremendous upside. It, it, there's a lot of you know, prevention in that. And so it's, you know, it, it's tough that they, that the patient got COVID, but if we're able to look at high-risk patients, give them an infusion of this drug and keep them out of the hospital, that's a win. We, we need to take that win because we had some pretty sick patients in the hospital. Convalescent plasma. So individuals who have had COVID in the past, we were asking them to donate blood um, for a long time. And so we were studying that. It's, there's not enough data right now to say whether or not it's working or whether, whether or not it's not. It's just a, a reminder that the scientific process, it takes a while. 
And so we're just not seeing the outcomes just yet, but that'll be continued to be studied. And then corticosteroids or steroids, there are specific situations where this applies. There's a number of really interesting things. And it's, it, it's very transparent in that they list everything that, that has been done, that they, that they read and that they were able to review to, to come to their conclusion. And you know, individual physicians may or may not agree, but I think it's important when you look at consensus across individuals that work at, at, in the NIH, very important to, to go by you know, what they say. So they, they typically don't recommend against, but they will say that it's not recommended, that it's, it has shown no efficacy um, in, order to be, uh, in order to be recommended for. Uh, vaccines um, have shown to reduce the likelihood of spread is what I think I was, I was trying to, to say there. 45 slides, I think that's the one line that got by me in proofreading, sorry. Um, but there is no prophylactic treatment outside of vaccination that is recommended to prevent COVID-19 infection. Does anybody know who that person is on the right-hand side? Anybody know the movie? It was one of my favorites before the pandemic. That's Jude Law in Contagion. If you've not seen it, it's a great follow-up to this lecture. Uh, I, I advise popcorn and uh, and a, a a decent tea if you're a tea drinker. If you're gonna watch that, it's a good movie um, and and eerily similar to what we experienced. But you know, his drug was forsythia, which is a, a make believe drug. Um, I won't I won't comment on what has been pushed during this pandemic. But um, there are a number of things that I said. Oh, if you take X, Y, or Z, you will definitely not get COVID unless. Unless the words are shelter, vaccine, or a trip on a boat by yourself, there's nothing that's going to that's going to be prophylactic um, that's been proven to to prevent COVID nineteen other than the vaccines. So this is uh, Operation Warp Speed. Um, hopefully you've heard of it. So this was um, the initial um, Operation Warp Speed is specifically developed to uh, ask vaccine makers to take risks and not with outcomes. So the, the problem with vaccines are, number one, they typically don't make money. And number two, it takes forever to do everything. And by the time you're done, you're all the way through it, you may have a vaccine for something that's no longer a problem. And so what Operation Warp Speed did said, the United States government will pay you as long as, you, as, long as the product that you make is is effective, um, you can show that it's effective, we will pay all of your upfront costs. We are taking all of that risk off of you. You don't have to try to make money off of this on the back end. And so the you go through your initial trials of how do I make this so that um, it, it is safe for people to take? And then once it is safe, safe to take, how do we make a safe product that prevents COVID? And in that time, once you have that, 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 that you can at least um, scientifically prevent COVID with this vaccine, the United States is saying produce as much as you can, as fast as you can. Um, and so we will, even if it gets through and it ends up, you know, and, and we end up not using it, we are going to pay you for everything you just did. And so that's a huge relief. So it's billions of dollars that were spent. And it, it really, and you can see the timeline here, it didn't even take 16 months. We were, we, were, we started it, I think in, in March, and we were done. We had shots in arms in December. In nine months, they were able to do that. And we have a, a few stories after this about how that was possible. But it is um, there's nothing short of of, of amazing of, of how that went down. And so it's it's one of the scientific marvels, and, I'm, and one of the reasons I was so proud to be a scientist, not in, remotely involved in this, just that science could do that, and that's really really cool. How am I doing on time? I'm trying to make sure I don't err. I'll keep going, sorry. Um, so the vaccines, we're looking at Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, um, both of which are two doses. Uh, Pfizer was um, knocked because we had to, we had to buy uh, freezers that could go down to like minus 80 degrees. That's not something we typically have in hospitals and definitely not something that's easily um, available for the public. Um, but those were the rules of the game. We were able to do that. Moderna um, still needed to be frozen and also two doses. 
And uh, frozen is better than ultra cold, but still not necessarily something that's easy, both of which are multi-dose multi vials. And that has to do with the, our ability to try and vaccinate as many people as we can. And there's no preservative. So once you enter that vial, you've got six hours. At six hours, if there's anything that's left in there, you got to throw it away um, and probably shed a tear doing it too. Johnson & Johnson is a virus vector vaccine. And so it uses a, a, an adenovirus, and we'll talk about that in about a second. Um, it's only one dose. There's no follow-up uh, needed. It's only for refrigeration, uh, but also multi-dose and, and preservative. So on paper, you know, Johnson & Johnson's the way to go for logistics. So if you have individuals that are tough to get to, you don't think you're going to get them twice, Johnson & Johnson is, is the one. Um, and we'll talk about the pause, too. I, wouldn't, I couldn't talk about this without doing that. The mRNA vaccine history is really cool. I have the link down the bottom. After you get this presentation, go and read the whole story. Um, I'm sure they probably played up some of the drama, but I really, really thought it was cool. Um, so it, actually the mRNA therapy was developed 30 years ago, or the start was developed 30 years ago. Uh, we got it to work in mice in, in 1990, but it took 15 more years for a University of Penn researcher to get it to work in humans. And she literally worked all 15 years being demoted because she couldn't get grants because she wasn't being able to prove her theory. But then in 2005, she proved her theory literally two years after SARS. Um, and, uh, and it actually, her discovery found, helped found Moderna. Moderna saw that and said, we can do a lot of stuff with this, including um, create embryonic stem cells or create vaccines. And so they actually started with mRNA vaccine work in 2018. Um, so this is a confluence of events that you could not make up for a movie. Um, Pfizer Biotech. Biotech is the, uh, is the company that partnered with Pfizer. Uh, they actually started as a immunotherapy company and started trying to do a vaccine for cancer using mRNA. So we have two companies that are using mRNA um, specifically for vaccine work. And then COVID comes around and we need vaccines as fast as humanly possible um, and definitely not using a live virus. Um, so they, they were the ones that... Uh, that were able to step up to the call and really did a phenomenal job. Again, go down and read the um, go down and read the, the the entire story. Picture on the right hand side. I think uh, definitely shout out to uh, I can't remember her name for uh, Catal Cataline. And so she was the one that believed in this so much. She literally almost lost her job um, as a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, believing in this science. In this science, so um, she is the unsung hero of the COVID nineteen outbreak response. Viral vector vac vaccines. Uh, it's been used since the 1970s. It's an old technology. It uses a virus that can't replicate to, to shoot in parts of uh, the virus that we're trying to make antibodies to. Uh, and I, I did that quickly because I knew we had a picture and pictures are much better than words. So, uh, and that's for me too. So I love that. The right-hand side is mRNA. So we put mRNA strand. So a strand of the genetic material that only creates this one thing that is going to elicit an antibody response. And we, we inject that into the arm. It goes into the lymphatic system. Your lymph cells see it and say, oh, okay, I need to make antibodies to this. And then in the second shot, you are literally um, testing it to be like, uh, do you remember this guy? A um, hundred times out of a hundred, they do remember that guy. And they just start producing those antibodies. And that's why you have that, that uh, you can have a reaction or uh, what it feels like a reaction to the vaccine, even though it's just your body creating some... Um, it creating a response to what it knows it's supposed to. Left-hand side, which I think is, is it's older, but it is still pretty cool. So that's a, uh, that's an adenovirus that is killed, that, that hexagon, one, two, three, four, five, six, but a hexagon with the genetic material in it. And you see that that goes into the cell um, and then does basically the same thing just by a different method. Uh, a word on the J&J &J pause. So Johnson & Johnson has been asked to pause their, their rollout. Uh, well, we are pausing Johnson & Johnson's rollout of their vaccine for a few reasons. There's a, um, there have been six instances of a clot, um, and clots are not necessarily all that, all that rare, but this is a very specific clot in the central venous sinus. And so it's a part of the brain where all the blood dumps into, and that's where it's a pretty specific spot to get a clot, and it's only with Johnson & Johnson. And so it appeared about six to 13 days after the vaccine. A little bit of context. Number one, it's six million doses, almost seven million doses. We are less than one in a million chances. The likelihood of this happening on its own is like five in a million. The relative risk of clotting for other things that we do, even though it's a different mechanism, 
Um, but for birth control, nine out of 10,000 women will develop a deep vein thr thrombosis or a clot in one of their big muscles from, um, from a number of things. Or uh, in, in COVID disease, which is really what we should be comparing it to, instead of one in a million, it's 20 and half a million. So it's 40 in a million. So you have a 20 times greater chance of getting a clot from this particular virus as opposed to the, the vaccine. It is probably going to be approved. I don't have any forewarned knowledge to say that, but it was good to take a beat. Let's look at what's going on. Let's look at the numbers and how things are playing, off, playing out. You know, let's the next seven or so days play out to see how many more happen and then make a decision. So the cool thing is that it's uh, ACIP, the American College for Immunization Practices, and they don't work for the government. They actually a lot of times disagree with the government and they're the ones that give all the recommendations to physicians to say, this is, you know, this is what we need to, this is what we recommend physicians do. Uh, Marcy Dries is kind of a, uh, she's a non-voting member, but she gets to go to those, those meetings too. So we'll get to, I think Friday, tomorrow is the day that the, the next meeting is. Transmission and prevention. Tell me, stop me if you've heard this one before. Uh, masking, physical distance, vaccination, and hand hygiene. Uh, is there anything new on that? Just want to make sure. I didn't think so. So th this has been the same mantra all the time. Uh, physical distancing, keep at least six feet away. Outside is better than inside. Masking. I saw for the first time somebody wearing a strainer on their face. An actual wire strainer that I use for my kids' macaroni and cheese. And I, 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 was, I was dumbfounded. I'm like... Uh, that's not it. <laughs> that yeah, there we go. That's not it. Um, but outside of strainers, you know, big gaps, valves, um, you know, a, a face shield, just the clear face shield, not a mask. That's really our biggest um, getting people to wear masks. I don't. I I care if it's a band. If we are all masked, and then we can start working on bandanas. You know, the the bandanas or the the um, the tied handkerchiefs or whatever. Just get something over your face. I need something that is not a wire strainer over your face. I will not never not show this picture because I was in the next room um, and it was a pretty cool event. Perfect mask wearing, by the way. Terrible mask wearing, by the way. Um, the left, uh, my my left hand side, at least your left hand side too. You see that big valve on there. That's that is a COVID get out of jail free card. On the right hand side. I think I'd wear that on a motorcycle or skiing. That's about it. Uh, that is not stopping your droplets from getting out to others. I have seen the one on the left-hand side and I just kept walking quickly far away. Uh, that is not stopping anything. The one on the right, I kind of feel for him. Maybe he was, ca he was caught out his last mask. You know, I, of course I make up these little scenarios. Maybe his last mask tore off his ears and he's like, oh my God, I need something. And so he had rubber bands and and a t-shirt, still not good enough. <laughs> Appreciate the effort though. Um, but really with prevention, you're looking at how do you mitigate your risk? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you prevent as much risk as possible while still being able to live? Um, there's no such thing as a zero, as a zero risk environment anymore. Um, and I'll get to a, um, a graph in a hot second that kind of lays out what's better and what's worth and worse in terms of risk. Um, just important, uh, we talked about this before, it's transmitted through respiratory droplets. The person may or may not have symptoms. Uh, the, the person may be close to you within six feet, or if you're like running on a treadmill with no mask, living your life freely, um, and you are pre-symptomatic with COVID, you are shedding it well, uh, well further than six feet, especially if you're really going and getting it and breathing deep, or if you're laughing at a bar or if you're at a restaurant talking loud, these are all activities that will spread it further. Um, well, let's move on. So this is uh, Pop, uh, Saskia Popescu, uh, who's from the University of, uh, or she's from Arizona. I don't know if she's with the university, but she's one of the epidemiologists, phenomenal individual to, to follow on Twitter for all of her COVID knowledge. Um, to help put this together, bottom left, lowest risk, top right, highest risk. You get to see walking outdoors with or without pets. Um, I love that they give you the option. Running or biking alone or with somebody else, very low risk. On the right-hand side, you see watching sports. You see how close they are together. Um, a movie theater uh, or live theater, the, end of, you know, the closer you get, the more indoors you get, the more people you get in the space, the higher risk it is. One of my favorite, this, uh, this is one of my favorite things that even I go back to it, like, what, you know, where am I at right now in my risk to make sure that I'm, I'm managing as much as I can? 
because my, my little one's got to play baseball. It's just got to happen. So I have to figure out a way to do it safely. So this is balancing um, COVID, balancing your risk for COVID. So it's not just what risk, where are you right now and how, what is the risk around you? What is your individual risk? And if you're going home to an individual that has um, comorbid conditions that could make COVID worse for them, how is that, you know, how are you going to manage your risk then? And I think it's, it's important to, uh, to realize that is, you know, it's not just us with contagious diseases. It is never just you. It is those that are around you too. So think about, you know, going home to a parent, grandparent, or, um, or potentially somebody who's immunocompromised, really manage your risk uh, closer to the low end than the, than the high end whenever possible. Uh, variants, and you asked, you said there was a few questions about it. Um, the, this is a much better slide for me. And again, this might be like long down the geek, geek trail, but um, the, you can see a lot of stuff on this slide. Left-hand side, far left-hand side at the bottom, January of 20, 20, January 16, 2021 is really when we started um, locally and nationally doing a lot more um, gene sequencing to see what kind of, you know, what type of COVID is circulating here. And a variant uh, comes about because of a mutation. So mutants and variants are similar unless you're talking about X-Men. So X-Men are mutants. But if you're in Marvel, then I think you were called enhanced. Sorry. Um, so, so mutations, individual mutations cause, uh, cause variants and, you know, variants can then also get more mutations and, and, and uh, become a different variant. And so when it becomes important to us is if you, if it then becomes airborne, right? So if we're talking about a droplet within six feet generally, but all of a sudden it becomes a variant and now it, it spreads much, much further, that's important for us to know because then our strategies change. It's not just social distancing. It is, it is, it is much different. Or if it becomes much more virulent. So if, if, it, if we get a variant that kind of, now it's starting to act closer to MERS or to SARS with those huge death uh, percentages, that's important to know too. Largely right now, it's just making it spread a little bit easier. And you can see that, I'll call it a tan peach bar goes from almost nothing, one, 2% on January, 2021, by the end on the right-hand side, B117 is, is the predominating strain that's circulating in the United States right now. And so that's, that's the UK variant. Um, there is also the California variant. There's also the Brazil variant. I'm sure there'll be a number of variants coming out of India, um, but this is, we keep an eye on them. This is why we do genetic typing to make sure that we're, we're, we know what's circulating and how it's behaving. Uh, because if it starts behaving badly, we need to be able to change our strategy quickly, keep people safe. Going forward, um, SARS-CoV-3, right? Uh, that was the question that I, I completely avoided earlier. I hope that person's still on. Sorry for taking so long. The, uh, it depends on, on how SARS-CoV-3 behaves. Um, we are better prepared now, and I'll say that because the mRNA technology has shown that we can safely and effectively create a vaccine in a short amount of time to coronaviruses. Uh, this is assuming SARS-CoV-3 is actually a coronavirus. If it ends up being another mutant flu or, you know, or a norovirus that, that just won't go away, um, you know, that, that is something that's just a little bit different. Uh, but the, the scientific break, breakthroughs that we've made this year with um, producing PPE, with producing viruses, with, um, with the scientific method, I think has prepared us well. I don't know that it ends that that it ends any better than this particular one does, just because year over you know outbreak over outbreak they continue to um, they they continue to do it right. They being the viruses, uh, but we continue to have an answer for them. So I'm hopeful that if it does if it is something that spreads quickly like SARS CoV uh, CoV two, that we're able to to match that in some way shape or form. And again, you know I hope it doesn't take another greatest act of humanity. Uh, in our history to, to stamp it down, but uh, I'm very hopeful that, that science can win. Uh, I, I have to think that I'm a, I'm a scientist. Um, vaccine boosters, um, what, one of the other things about going forward, we saw almost zero flu this year. There were 20 cases of flu in the state of Delaware, um, which, is, uh, which is basically zero, that's a rounding error. And so, you know, maybe masking works. Maybe we mask every flu season. Uh, as an infection preventionist, I would love that. Um, as, as a dad who has to go to a thousand sports, I don't know that I like that, but uh, from flu prevention, that makes sense. 
Um, and, you know, the reduced capacity environments are becoming less and less common despite in, in increasing race, case counts. So going forward, the immediate future, looking to other countries to make sure that we can vaccinate them as fast as we vaccinated ourselves. And then, um, you know, trying to, to find out what normal looks like because we're still not on the back end of this. And I do apologize. I took like three hours longer than I was supposed to. Oh, I got some memes. You can't leave without the memes. Um, one of my favorites that popped up early. It's good. <laughs> I have too many pops. <laughs> it's for your own good. Stop touching your face. Like a good neighbor, stay over there. <laughs> and uh, just hanging around till they waiting for the end of this pandemic. I see 65 comments up there. So hopefully I love I the memes. I love the memes. All right. <laughs> so so there are still some questions. Mm -hmm. Um do you think that the flu season will be worse next year since there's no data on the most common strands from this year? Good question. There is data. It says that we didn't have much. Um, so the, uh, it's always a mathematical equation anyway. Um, I would assume that the, uh, I'm pretty sure that it's H1N1 and H3N2, the, the typical strains that that uh, circulated in the year prior that were the minimal flu this year. I do worry about, since not many of us were exposed to flu this year, kind of like a waning immun um, immunity, uh, especially in those that didn't take the flu vaccine this year. So it, potentially you could have uh, some of the flu, um, some, uh, I'll say worse outcomes with the flu, but um, something tells me that we will still have some sort of distancing, masking something next year to kind of combat some of that. But good question. Um, but I, I, I'm hopeful that we have a little bit of carryover and that, uh, you know, that we don't get another pandemic on top of a pandemic. So do you know if there's been any correlation between people getting the annual flu shots and whether or not they're quote unquote immune to COVID? Yeah, there's not been any crossover. Um, my understanding is that, that there's not been any crossover between flu and, and COVID immunity. So there are a couple questions, you know, will, will we ever be able to return to normal life or is this the new normal? How long until the world looks as if COVID never happened? <laughs> Go ahead, take out your uh, crystal ball. <laughs> uh, um, after SARS, we saw a number of Asian communities um, continue to mask. And until 2020, that looked weird to Western America. Uh, to, to Western countries. That was not something we did. And I think now we know why. Um, I don't, I, I think masking in some circles will become a little bit more uh, normal. I think that it'll be, you'll still see them. You'll see them a lot more um, in, in the US and, and in the West than you did before. So I think normal is going to be, um, it, it will not be 19 or 2019, 1999. It will not be 2019 again. Um, I will say in a very long time, if ever, we, we, we've learned a lot in this particular pandemic. And I think if we go back then, then we potentially could be setting ourselves up for uh, SARS-CoV-3. So um, that definitely not, I, I do not see 2021 being um, the 2019 that we remember, um, maybe 2023. It depends on, on what COVID decides it wants its relationship with us to be. If it's okay with being seasonal like flu, um, we could potentially get closer to what we used to be, maybe a little bit more masking. If it wants to um, stick around and continue to to create new variants that that spread quickly, it could be closer to what we're what we're doing right now. This could be our newest of, of normal. Uh, I'm not necessarily the most optimistic person to ask this question, so I apologize if I bummed anybody out at the end of the night. But I will wait and see, and I will not um, I will not count COVID out until um, in, until we get to near zero. Cool. So as far as vaccines are concerned, are there any updates regarding, you know, people under the age of 16? Will we need booster shots in six months? You know, how long does the vaccination last? Any, any information like that? Yeah, so we, we knew that um, coronaviruses, the, the colds, the, the, the really mild ones, we had almost no immunity to them before. There was no, uh, no long lasting anything. And so that we had a vaccine that currently works, uh, I think we're, we're on nine months to a year. Um, so it works for at least a year, and every day that it works is a blessing. So um, I, I, we don't know how long it's going to work again, because this is the first successful mRNA uh, vaccine for, for a coronavirus, and it 
Um, incidentally, they found out after the fact, the way they designed it, that it happened to work is the best way to design a vaccine. The, the carrier that they put it in goes right to your lymphatic system. Do not pass go, do not collect $200 and does exactly what it needs to do. No must, no fuss and, and creates long lasting immunity. So, um, you think uh, it's going to be like a game changer? I, it's so if they can get the frozen thing under control, um, that, that's going to be the big thing because nobody's got a minus 80 freezer. Uh, we had to, you know, places had to buy them. And um, so that, that, will, that will be the, if they can do that with like room temperature, th that will be a game changer, I think. Um, so it, we may have to do boosters. Maybe, like I said, maybe you, maybe you get your flu, RSV, and COVID shots every year, and that's and that's good enough. Or maybe maybe this one lasts outlasts uh, the coronavirus. I'm hoping for the latter. I'm probably thinking more of the former. Probably a, a a booster down the line. Do you know if there's any local participation in post-COVID syndrome research? Hmm. Good question. There's, uh, there's a website, I'm taking more notes. Uh, there's a website about the different studies uh, and I don't have it off the top of my head. Post COVID uh, and post COVID syndrome, I assume that they mean um, what is colloquially called uh, long haulers. So individuals that have symptoms long after. Yep. Um, and there was somebody who put in, a, in the chat, um, you know, I asked you the question whether MERS and SARS were, were any kind of help against COVID. Apparently there was um, the MERS DNA vaccine induces immunity and protects from virus challenge in preclinical models. So something. I, I'd be very excited um, if we, if that, if that, whatever works, let's make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so here's an interesting question I hadn't thought of. Do you know if either of the vaccines react or, you know, give extra protection or something to people with sickle cell? They don't. Um, and this, I, I don't know that there's extra, um, I don't know that one group get, gets anything extra from either, from any of the individual vaccines. I would say if you have a sick, sickle cell physician, which most sickle cell, most patients with sickle cell do, um, definitely go to them. So the individual, um, I definitely advocates for specific um, disease states, cancer, um, hypothyroidism, you know, whatever it might be, heart, um, heart failure, you know, go to your, the physician that you trust and ask them, can I get just any, any vaccine or do you think there's one better than another? And then ask about timing, specifically thinking about cancer with surgery and with treatments and things like that, um, because they're going to know you both and they're going to know that very specific disease state and how it kind of interacts with, um, with the different vaccines. And, uh, you know, for, for breast cancer uh, survivors that are getting their, their images, if you get your shot on your left side, it will inflame a lymph node on that side. So they will say, don't get it if you're going to, you know, within X amount of time, if you're going to go and get your scans, because it will be, um, it, it could throw up a false negative or whatever it might be. So uh, really important to have that great relationship to, with your, with your primary. And um, as long as you get it, I'm happy. Cool. Well, the, there are more questions, but they were all either answered during your presentation or they were very similar to the ones that I asked you. So um, that's it. Unless somebody has one that wants to throw in the chat right now. Uh, all right, there's one. Do we know how the vaccine impacts those individuals with autoimmune disorders and what the effectiveness is? Good question. So that, that came up a lot early. So I think the, uh, the standard line uh, from those of us that, are, that work in uh, vaccine centers is that the, the only contraindication to vaccine is having a, a significant life-threatening allergic reaction to the vaccine or one of its components. Um, and so it, it, I'm not saying, there's nothing saying you can't get it. And this is, if you're immunocompromised, um, then I would definitely say, talk it over with, with your physician. Again, manufacturer, um, timing, everything is, is really, really important, but there's nothing that says you can't get it. Um, it just might be timing or manufacturer differences that would, that would make the difference for you. And I'm going to guess that the answer to this is no, because I'm pretty sure the answer is no. But do you know of any potential long-term side effects of the vaccines yet? I don't think we've had enough time to, to prove that yet. <laughs> yeah, no, we've not seen. Well, so I would say that, that the only side effects from the vaccine that have been found were those kind of local reactions, 
um, vasovagal reactions where people faint. Um, my favorite story is that we had somebody just so excited, so excited um, that the minute the needle went in her arm, she was out like a light. And, you know, you, you feel bad, but, you know, she, but she woke up just as excited as, as when she went out, not realizing anything had happened. So um, those are really the only reactions that, that we're having with the, um, with the vaccine. There is the, the vaccine adverse event reporting system. And so that's how they caught on to the clot issue, the CVST, the central venous sinus thrombosis issue. So, but nothing has come out of uh, theirs um, yet to say that there's anything other than the, the clot issue and some of the local reactions early on. But Have we seen it, any, any deaths from the vaccine yet? Uh, I've not. So there are individuals either. who have passed that got the vaccine. Um, that being said, uh, none have been linked to the vaccine. Um, okay. And so that's, uh, none, not, so nothing has come out about that. So right. uh, yeah, the thing that most people don't understand is just because something happened after you got the vaccine doesn't necessarily mean that the vaccine is what caused that thing to happen. And right. that's, that's the whole point of having theirs to, to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, you can figure out what caused the things to happen. And if you're worried about sense of, you know, oh, they're not, they're not going to figure it out. Six clots. They had yeah. 6.8 million doses given and they found they actually, they, they, they knew about it before the sixth, uh, but they were looking at it. And so, you know, really sensitive to that stuff, especially with, every, with all the information going on uh, around vaccines. So uh, very important um, to, to feel, I think it's important to feel comfortable because it is a very safe vaccine. Um, it, you know, I tried to give you a little bit of background with, you know, it has, we've been working on it for 30 years. It's been uh, effective in humans or the the technology since 2005 like this is not something that we're like you know what i'm going to do today like this is not a, a off the cuff kind of thing this was a very methodical scientific process that got us to where we're at um and, and thankful that it did i didn't think i did not think we'd ever get a vaccine for this and that's super stoked <laughs> so i'm going to ask one last question be from the chat because i think it's a, a nice way to take us out is there any way to distinguish COVID-19 from other respiratory illnesses now that we've been doing it for a while? So if it's, uh, if it's cough, no. Um, if it's, you know, runny nose or, or sneezing, no. Um, there, there are those general things that um, you just, you, and we were like this before COVID. So if you walked into the ER or your doctor's office with, with a cough and a fever, it's like 13 different things it could have been. Um, if in flu season, we typically thought it was flu, so we would test you for that. Um, some of the hallmarks of, of COVID, though, the loss of sense of taste and the loss of sense of smell. Uh, that morning coffee doesn't taste like anything. Hmm. Um, burn toast. See if you can smell that. <laughs> uh, or don't burn toast. But, you know, find um, th that's a pretty good indication. There are a few things that can cause that, too. Enteroviruses, other viruses, respiratory viruses can cause that. But in the midst of a COVID pandemic where that is one of the hallmark symptoms, I would say that is probably a good sign to get a mask, call your physician and get tested. Um, one of the things that is a hallmark of, you, want, you, know, you wouldn't know uh, as a patient, but it's called happy hypoxia or hypoxemia. So it's, you're walking around fine, thinking the world is grand, but your blood oxygen levels just keep ticking down, just keep ticking down. And then all of a sudden it all hits you and you can't compensate and you end up um, in the ICU. So that was, um, that, that was something that we found early on that you know, people were feeling fine. And then you put that, 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 high, that um, pulse oximeter on their finger and all of a sudden you're showing numbers in the 70s and it's supposed to be 98, 98, 99, you know, higher than 95. And you're looking at them like, this is, something's gotta be wrong. Nail polish, like what's wrong here? And it was just the, the body compensating for that. So you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't know about that, but you would definitely know about the loss of taste of sense and smell. All righty, well, Tim Bowers, thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. And uh, folks, uh, next week for all the moms and sisters and, and whatnot uh, online, get, your, get the guys in your uh, household online too. We're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Mihir Shah. He's gonna be talking about the importance of prostate uh, screening and the latest in treatment options. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Again, Tim, thank you very much.